If you've ever enjoyed shows like Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z, Power Rangers, and Super Sentai, then you owe it to yourself to learn about one of Japan's greatest manga authors to ever walk this earth. His name is Shotaro Ishinomori. His influence and ideas continue to live on in the works of creators today, but he has yet to receive the flowers he deserves from the Western audience. The color-oriented teams in Sailor Moon and Power Rangers, the costume of the modern-day Blue Beetle, the androids in Dragon Ball, it all starts with him and a heartbreaking moment in his life that changed the course of his career. Today, I want to talk to you about the life of Shotaro Ishinomori, as well as the struggles and sadness he endured that led him to a journey that changed his life. Shotaro Ishinomori was born and raised in Ishinomori-cho, a county of Tomei in Miyagi Prefecture. He grew up in a time when Japan was redefining itself after World War II. While he grew up enjoying reading and writing, he spent a good part of his early school life blacking out any words related to the war in his textbooks. A lot of the reading material that was available at the time was destroyed or blacked out, and any books he did get his hands on was outside of his reading level. So, in order to entertain himself, he decided to create a magazine with his older sister, Yoshie, that included both texts and illustrations. Ishinomori loved his sister. Out of everyone in his family, she is the only one who supported his endeavors. She encouraged him to draw his heart out. Now, Ishinomori had eczema, which flared up during the hot summer days. He didn't want to be bullied, so he spent a lot of time with his sister indoors. Yoshie had a bad case of asthma, so the two often spent time together, and they drew pictures together to get through the hard days. His parents, however, wanted him to focus on his studies, so he did just that. Until one day, he discovered something called a manga, a graphic novel that would change his life. It was called Shin Takarajima or New Treasure Island by Tezuka Osamu, the godfather of manga. He was so enamored by the panels and sequence of drawings that told a story. It's like the pictures are movie, he exclaimed. He was so in love with this book that he wanted to do it too. He emulated Tezuka's art so much that his art style was practically a mirror of the Shin Takarajima author. When Ishinomori entered middle school, he learned that newspapers and magazines had sections dedicated to reader submissions. He contributed to these magazines and newspapers as much as possible. He also started entering little art contests, winning some and losing some. And eventually, that all got old for him. Ishinomori then set his sights on something bigger, Manga Shonen, a magazine that had room to house more reader submission. And this is actually when he created the pen name, Shotaro Ishinomori. His real name is Shotaro Onodera, but he decided to name himself after the county he lived in, Ishinomori. Back to the story? He drew and sent original stories to the magazine and became a regular contributor. He quickly made a name for himself in the world of manga. Everyone he would eventually meet later in life was watching him. Thanks to Manga Shonen, he was especially watching by a certain figure in the industry, Tezuka Osamu, the man whose book set the young author on the path to becoming a manga artist. Now, Osamu reached celebrity status through his works. Every magazine wanted him. He was always pumping out work after work like some kind of one-man factory, which was a good thing, but kind of a bad thing because he took on more work than he could chew, to the point where he was known for missing deadlines in the editorial world. And discovering Ishinomori was his answer to meeting those deadlines. Osamu sent a letter to Ishinomori, requesting for his help in Tokyo. Honored by the request, Ishinomori ups and leaves to the capital of Japan. Here's the thing though, Ishinomori hasn't graduated just yet, and a trip to Tokyo from Miyagi Prefecture back then would take 12 hours. He had no choice but to take a break from school to help Osamu. This would eventually cause a rift between him and his parents, but it was a path he was willing to take. Becoming a manga assistant for Tezuka gave Ishinomori professional experience. He took what he learned and finally made his debut serialization in Manga Shonen. Not a regular contributor now, but as someone who is serialized. At this time, drawing manga had become a lucrative field for aspiring manga artists, especially shonen manga, manga aimed at the male demographic. More and more magazines were starting their own line of shonen manga, and Ishinomori wanted to be a part of this boom. Only problem was, he needed to move to Tokyo, and so he did. His parents weren't too happy, and they didn't even bother seeing him off at the train station. But his ill sister did though, and this wasn't goodbye, because Ishinomori planned on making it big to get her the treatment she needs. I will call for you one day, and will get your illness treated in a hospital in Tokyo, Ishinomori vowed. And with that said, he made his way to Tokyo, where he had his own lodging before moving to Tokyo Aso, an apartment that housed many of the now legendary manga artists just starting out. He was hopeful, ambitious, and unfortunately, unemployed. Ishinomori planned to continue his work for Manga Shonen after arriving in Tokyo, but literally upon his arrival, the magazine ceased publication because not only was the manga field, particularly shonen manga, a lucrative field, it was incredibly competitive. Luckily for the young artist, he found steady work drawing for Kodansha Shoujo Club, a magazine that published stories and manga for the shoujo or female demographic. 
Life at Tokiwaso was comparable to living in a college dorm. It was full of struggle and passion. And this is where Ishinomori would make lifelong relationships that would last a lifetime. He befriended the residents there, but he forged a bond with Fujio Akatsuka, creator of Osomatsu-kun. Together, they formed a team. Hideko Mizuno, one of the only few female residents of Tokiwaso, also joined their team. Together, they formed a pseudonym, Yumaya, and would work together on serializations. Now, this is a tidbit that is often left out of stories regarding the apartment. While it is true, that Tokiwa So was full of men, there was also female residents and visitors coming in and out of the dorm. And who were these female residents other than the manga authors like Mizuno? Well, everyone's moms. And what were they doing there? Well, essentially being their mom. Making food for them to make sure they're getting plenty to eat. Doing their laundry tidying up their room. A lot of the people at Tokiwaso lacked basic practical skills. They also didn't have time to take care of themselves. Ishinomori himself also suffered stomach aches from eating rotten salad. Luckily, his beloved sister Yoshie arrived from their hometown and stayed with him at Tokiwaso to take care of her helpless little brother. She helped out with housework and such at Tokiwaso, and she easily got along with everyone who was staying there. It's also hinted that she developed romantic feelings for one of the residents there. She was described as the Madonna of Tokiwa So, and really brought some brightness to the intense atmosphere at the apartment building. On April 4, 1958, Yoshie collapsed from an intense asthma attack. She was then taken to the hospital closest to Tokiwa So. She was rushed to the hospital. After some waiting around, Yoshie's condition finally stabilized. Feeling bad for the trouble he caused his team, Ishinomori decided to take his team to the movies, a decision he would later regret. When the three artists returned to Tokiwa So from the cinemas, they were informed by Akatsuka's mother, who was waiting for them, that Yoshie had passed away because of a morphine overdose. She was 24 years old. This devastated everyone at the apartment, and this put Ishinomori into a deep depression. Many of the residents from the apartment made their way to Miyagi Prefecture to attend Yoshie's funeral, and upon returning back to the apartment, Ishinomori assisted every artist who missed their deadlines because of their attendance at his sister's ceremony. Ishinomori continued drawing as if nothing had happened. According to a 2020 interview with Mizuno, however, she witnessed Ishinomori breaking down while Akatsuka consoled him. In 1961, three years after Yoshie's death, Ishinomori decided it was time to quit drawing manga. Kodansha Shoujo Club was just months away from being cancelled. He didn't know what to do anymore. He didn't want to be in Tokyo So anymore because it was full of memories of his sister. He needed alone time and he wanted to take a break from everything. He wanted to quit being a manga artist and he also wanted to see the world. While Japan's relationship with other countries improved after World War II, it was still difficult to travel to other countries from Japan. So, Ishinomori went to Shueisha, one of his publishers, to request a travel visa in order to cover a science fiction convention in Seattle, Washington as a journalist. He took an advance payment and made his way abroad. And it's during his travels at his lowest point where he stumbled upon a page of an American magazine that would inspire his best works moving forward. And I'll get to that in just a bit. He also had a chance to visit other countries like Egypt, Europe, and other parts of Asia that helped broaden his horizons. And after about three months of traveling, he finally returned to Japan. Upon Upon his arrival, he left Tokyo so permanently and moved somewhere else in Tokyo. He also needed to find a job, so he continued doing what he does best, illustrating for manga magazines. Now, Ishinomori has been illustrating manga professionally since he was a high school student, but none of them were considered major hits or a magnum opus, until he wanted to introduce to Japan a work inspired by the very thing he learned overseas, the cyborg. Remember that magazine Ishinomori picked up overseas? Well, that was a life magazine that contained a short article about the concept of cyborgs by Nathan Klein and Manfred Kleins. The idea of a human with biomechanical parts was a concept new to Ishinomori, and it inspired him to formulate a story about a group of humans who underwent a surgery to become cyborgs. He was very excited to pitch this story. The only problem? No magazine wanted to pick up his series, no matter how hard he tried to pitch them. Publishers just didn't find the concept of cyborgs all that interesting. They wanted rehashes of things he had already done. Things like gags, romance, fantasy, whatever was popular at the time. They didn't want stories that explore humanity. It wasn't until he was met by a request from a magazine line that was just as desperate as himself. Weekly Shonen King reached out to Ishinomori with a request he thought he'd never get to hear. Just draw for us 
anything will do. Ishinomori was no longer bound by any editor's chains. He let his imagination run wild. He created a team of nine people, just like a baseball team. Every character was from a different part of the world. He even included a baby as one of the members, just to shake things up. I don't care if the editors will understand this work. I'm going to draw something that readers will find interesting, he shouted happily. He named the story Cyborg 009, and it was published in July of 1964. And he was right to follow his heart, because this story would give Ishinomori the recognition he deserved. It explored the themes of war and what makes a human. Until today, the series continues to have anime adaptations, movies, and OVAs. And Cyborg 009 was just the beginning. A couple of years after the debut of Cyborg 009, Ishinomori was approached by Toei producer Toru Hirayama, who wanted his help in creating a superhero on Mainichi Broadcast System, or MBS for short. I'm going to fast forward the Toei and Ishinomori collaboration, because it's too lengthy and I'll probably do a video dedicated to it later. Anyway, Ishinomori created a superhero named Kamen Rider. He used some elements from Cyborg 009, as well as inspiration from his other stories. Like in Cyborg 009, Kamen Rider is also a human who is kidnapped by an evil organization and turned into a cyborg to do their bidding. Instead, he uses that power against them and fights for the sake of mankind. Kamen Rider would go on to inspire many more sequels and other works in the future. It also helped popularize the trope of shouting attack names in battle manga. The show was a hit, and Toei began to collaborate with Ishinomori on more hero shows in the 70s, launching the Henshin boom. Around the mid-70s, the Kamen Rider franchise started to lose steam with the audience. Toei needed something new, something fresh, and Ishinomori understood the assignment. He cited his story, Shonen Dome, as one of his inspiration. He also took advantage of the fact that the majority of TV stations could now broadcast in color. He assigned one color to each character, with the belief that assigning different colors for every character would help emphasize their individual personalities. The series was titled Himitsu Sentai Go Ranger, and is the first entry in the Super Sentai franchise that still continues on today. Super Sentai inspired many shows like Sailor Moon and Yu Yu Hakusho, and I'm serious about the Yu Yu Hakusho one by the way. Ishinomori's life was full of darkness, but he introduced to the world the most colorful superheroes that stand the test of time, that now inspired the works of today. 